Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the podcast, The Written Page. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, and I'm coming to you, as usual, from Jackson in the state of Tennessee, in the United States of America. And today we're going to have a conversation, which for me is going to be a little bit like a trip back in time, back to the years that I spent at Vanderbilt University in Nashville in graduate school, because the uh, guest for this episode of The Written Page is a friend of mine from those years we kept in touch over the years um, off and on but um, you know we share a lot of different interests not just literary but uh, also in sports and music and <laughs> other things and I remember just um, hanging out with him and playing soccer with him and watching soccer on TV with him as well which uh, was nice uh, in those days when we had to work so much in graduate school, but then we all, always had these pockets of time to just get together and uh, watch soccer on TV and, and chat about other things that didn't have to do with our uh, work. We did share as well an interest in the same period of literature and similar languages, um, and we even shared our uh, dissertation director. Uh, and so going back to uh, those days, uh, I would like to introduce right now on the written page from Raleigh, North Carolina. He's an associate professor of Spanish at Meredith College in the beautiful city of Raleigh, North Carolina. My friend, Jonathan Wade. Jonathan, welcome to the written page. Uh, thank you very much, Anton. Uh, I appreciate the, the, the brief uh, trip down memory lane. Um, those are very, very fond memories and glad that uh, they're, they're not just in the past, but that uh, we have uh, and, and have maintained uh, good reasons to, to stay in contact. Well, same here, Jonathan. And um, the, the excuse for this uh, conversation today on the written page is the fact that just uh, about a month or a couple of months ago, uh, you have published a book entitled Being Portuguese in Spanish, Reimagining Early Modern Iber Iberian Literature from 1580 to 1640. And this is a book published by Purdue University Press, as I said, in this year of 2020, as a part of their uh, Purdue Studies in um, Romance Literature series, which, um, you know, uh, I think it's uh, number 78 on this. So there's several other interesting books from Purdue University Press in this series. And I would like to talk about this book, of course, but before uh, we do that, Jonathan, I'd like to take a little trip back in time, a little bit further back, and ask you how and when and under what circumstances uh, did your interest in languages like Spanish and Portuguese begin in your life? Well, I grew up in California, in Northern California, a uh, fairly small city, um, particularly small because we lived a little bit removed from the city called Lodi, um, made famous by a, a CCR song. Great song, Lodi, great song. <laughs> as you may know. Um, and, you know, in, in that uh, part of California, uh, there being the San Joaquin Valley, um, I was around a lot of Spanish. I had um, friends uh, uh, in, in elementary school. Uh, we ended up moving to Colorado when I was 14, but before we had moved, I, I was already taking my first Spanish classes, um, and it was just, just something I always enjoyed, something I always succeeded at. Um, I had some older siblings who, uh, uh, various uh, reasons, uh, spent time abroad, um, uh, and, and, and seeing, uh, you know, your, your older siblings travel, some of them learning Spanish, some of them other languages, you know, it, it, it you don't realize until old, when you're older and you're thinking about how you got to where you, where you are. Uh, but those, those were impactful experiences for me to see, you know, uh, family members, um, and the world opened up pretty early for me. And I think, uh, I had an interest in languages even before Spanish was ever um, in my life. Um, I, you know, I remember being taught, for example, kind of a memorized prayer in Finnish of all languages. I, I don't speak Finnish, um, but my dad did, um, and uh, and something that he once learned um, as a as a missionary, and uh, and so I, I, you know, languages were kind of part of the family identity. Um, and, and so, 
I, you know, I just kept up with Spanish always in school. And even um, when I, you know, was finished, I, so I took it every year of high school, but my high school was small enough. We didn't have uh, advanced placement uh, Spanish, but I just, uh, again, I, I enjoyed it. I identified with, um, with it, uh, even though it's not a part of my ethnic heritage, uh, it was just something I always um, valued. Um, and so at college, it was a no-brainer to, to kind of imagine that I would do whatever I do and, and also do Spanish. Um, and uh, so that's it's kind of the roots of, of, of Spanish. Of course, uh, it, I took a leap from there um, by spending two years in, in Argentina. Um, so my first kind of love of, of uh, Spanish-speaking culture was was Argentina, was Latin America, and as Anton, you know very well, um, my my soccer uh, tastes <laughs> are very much influenced by uh, those experiences. I, uh, coincidentally, uh, always had played soccer and loved soccer, but I never understood soccer um, and its place within world culture um, and 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 identity across the globe. Uh, and so that's something that Argentina gave me, a kind of a gift. Um, among many other things, uh, was uh, a different, uh, a more profound love for things I already enjoyed, um, like the Spanish language, uh, like uh, like football. Um, so there's a little bit of background about how I kind of came to to, to Spanish as a language and yeah. some of the cultures um, um, uh, that, uh, that that they use that language. Now you you have traveled uh, quite widely and within you know the Spanish and Portuguese speaking world, uh, even uh, in the northwest of Spain where I was originally born myself. And um, I wonder um, after you know having done some traveling and still, uh, of course, not right now because of our situation of confinement and 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 the uh, pandemic, it's not possible to to, to tra travel at least for a while, but. Uh, this is an ongoing interest uh, of yours. You, you, you keep traveling to different places uh, where Spanish and Portuguese are spoken. Um, and I wonder, what, what, you know, besides the language and besides soccer, what, what other elements of Spanish and Portuguese culture uh, sort of attract you? Well, you know, because uh, my time in Argentina coincided with kind of an overall coming of, any, a coming of age, you know, a real opening of, of my mind, um, a real uh, sense of what it means to have deep and abiding relationships and friendships. Uh, I could tell you that, you know, just the, the warmth and, and kindness and acceptance uh, that I enjoyed in, in Argentina was something I realized wasn't Argentine, right? This was something that because I now knew this language, you know, uh, there were endless, you know, seemingly endless worlds um, um, that I could 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 visit and experience in a, in a much more meaningful way. And the key there being the, the relationships, right? The people um, that I met um, they were they were the real motivating factor. Uh, and so when I came back from Argentina, yes, it was you know move forward with Spanish, but it was immediately as well. Okay, um, I've had this experience with Spanish. Um, let's add, let's add another language uh, what should i what's what's next and and i decided portuguese so i started taking portuguese and um that was actually the first class i took was an accelerated course offered for those who were already proficient um or native speakers of, of another romance language um someone that we both know james kraus ended up being in that exact same class mm -hmm. um he eventually uh, uh, studying with us at vanderbilt and is a, a portuguese professor at, at byu but um that led to an opportunity to go to brazil for a semester um i had definitely learned in argentina that the best way to learn the language was um to be immersed and to build relationships um, around that language and within that language and so, um, you know, after a semester in Brazil, you know, my love for Latin America had only grown. But again, I, I always knew coming away from these experiences that, yes, um, I had a specific love for Argentina and Brazil. Um, but I knew that I would feel that way or could feel that way about any place that I really opened my, my, my heart and, and mind to. And particularly where... Um, I had a chance to build, you know, community and, and, and get to know people and, and connect. And so um, that eventually led me across the Atlantic um, 
you know, I was gung ho about um, the experiences I'd had in Latin America, but um, I took a class um, with a professor who would become my undergraduate um, honors uh, thesis uh, director um, and a lifelong friend. Um, he he I took a class on the Quixote, and the Quixote just kind of changed everything for me academically and and then and, and my interest uh, in spain um which didn't start there it was really my 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 interest in spain was born out of an experience my brother had um he was in spain lived there i want to say for 10 months um in 92 he worked with uh, worked for nbc um during the olympics um mm. uh, that's not what led him there but he got that job being there and always um, just, you know, uh, the stories he told and the experiences he had really left an impression. Um, that's why I think in part I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm partial to Barcelona, <laughs> was that's where, he, that's where he lived. And I remember the stories he told about the way his, you know, humble apartment complex would kind of transform during a match. Um, and and um, even though they didn't have a, a television in his place, you know, you – you know, that energy was in the air. You could hear it. You could feel it. Um, and so, uh, you know, I decided to write an honors thesis on Don Quixote and um, applied for funding to, to basically, it's, as funny as it, as it sounds, I, I didn't really try and mask what I was doing. I, I really applied for money to go have an experience in Spain and in La Mancha. I felt like I, 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 um, I didn't have a real specific research agenda. I wasn't savvy enough at the time. Not sure I still am, you know, to be working specifically in archives at a library in Spain, but, um, was somebody, um, you know, who uh, was convincing enough that I, I received enough funding to, to make that trip happen. And, uh, spent five weeks, um, three of those weeks in a rental car, just, um, carving up as much of La Mancha initially and, and in the rest of, well, I say the rest. I really didn't see as much as you could see in five weeks because <laughs> I've always had I've always had kind of a more of a less is more mentality uh, when it comes to travel. I really want to be in a place and um, you know get as much out of that place as possible before moving on. And um, and that's um, honestly, I, I I still haven't seen a lot of Spain. Um, but I feel like uh, every community is inexhaustible in, in what it has to, to offer, um, which eventually, uh, as a professor, has led to the study abroad experiences you've alluded to. And um, I, uh, I, 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 I just uh, feel like there's, there's, there's uh, so much to learn, so much to gain, so much... Um, value and beauty and, and seeing how other, you know, cultures, um, are, are built and how uh, their values align with mine, how they expand my own ability to see my culture or what I want to make of my own family culture or the culture or the community that I live in. And, um, that's just, um, I guess, uh, a, a, a hunger that, um, has never been, you know, um, satisfied in the sense that, yeah, I'm satisfied every, every trip is, you know, I feel full and, and, but I'm always still hungry to, to go back. Um, and so, you know, that's why I think there's still a lot of unvisited um, parts of, of Spain and, and certainly Portugal as well. Um, because, uh, you know, it's, it's so easy to want to return to places that, you know, um, but haven't been, you know, still have uh, much mm -hmm. to experience and, and, and live there. Um, to say nothing of all the other places. Um, it was only two years ago that um, I made it to, finally made it to País Vasco, for example, um, into Cantabria and Asturias. Um, did a road trip with my family after sending the study abroad students home. And so, uh, you know, feel like I could go on and on, but uh, and I'm still only talking about a few countries. Um, uh, I remember being an undergraduate and, and, and wishing that there was some major that led to some job that was basically just live um, in different parts of the world and learn different languages for the rest of your life. And I'm sure that, you know, those opportunities exist. And I feel like I'm living, you know, uh, maybe a, 
a measure of that in in my life and in a full and full gratitude for for that um it, it truly is a, is a gift to to um and it's humbling to be able to to have these experiences in other countries and um and uh particularly um places where i've felt so warmly received and and uh and have uh, a real love for these places because really it's a, it's a reciprocal love. I, I'm I'm only trying to return the love and gratitude where I've been given so much of, of both. Now you've been uh, teaching Spanish at uh, Meredith College and uh, all girls school in uh, North Carolina and the city of Raleigh for several years now. And uh, uh, how much of uh, this personal experience of uh, traveling throughout um, different parts of the Spanish speaking and Portuguese speaking world, how much of that do you feel like you actually are able to bring uh, to the classroom? Well, um, I mean, I'd like to say it, it's always there um, because uh, I am who I am because of, of these experiences. And I, I believe that. Um, at, that you know whatever is working in the classroom is is directly informed by these experiences, but but there's more to it than that, of course, because um, you know uh, it's one thing to you know read a poem by Rosalia de Castro, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we do, and uh, she's one of my favorite poets. Uh, but it's a whole another uh, level when, by way of introduction to that poem, you can. You know, uh, show pictures uh, that you've taken, um, perhaps with uh, you know where I appear, or or I think more impactful for Meredith students than seeing me in a picture uh, with these with a monument of of Rosario de Castro uh, is our other Meredith students, right? Um, or to see you know um, that beautiful monument in in Alameda there in Santiago de Compostela, and, and there's this, just this gorgeous statue where I feel that the artist um, really conveyed in, in the way that she's postured and in her face, uh, the Mourinho or the Saudade that, um, that will come up in class that, that when we read certain poems, I'll, I'll talk about with students. And it's just great to be able to have, you know, someone could do a search and come across that same picture on Google, but, um, you know, if there's one thing that it, that I feel students have always um, said about my teaching is is that uh, I bring a level of, of enthusiasm and passion um, for what uh, what I teach, and I think that that is born directly out of, of the experiences that uh, that I've had and, and continue to have. Of course, especially because you know, at Meredith, starting in 2012. Um, I've been, you know, traveling with students to Spain every other summer, mm -hmm. and we spend most of that time in Santiago de Compostela, and um, and so even though it's only every other year, it seems like as soon as one of those experiences ends, um, a new cycle where I'm meeting students and and getting them interested um, in going to Spain um, begins in in earnest for, uh, right away. And really, there isn't a lot to do. The, the students, um, um, you know, are often recruited by the students who have recently been on, on that experience. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it, you know, there's there's something to, yes, you know, anyone um, with the right training and their, and and the interest um, can can teach, you know, X, Y, or Z poem. Um, but I believe part of what I'm, I'm giving students when I teach language, when I teach culture, when I teach literature, is not just right um, the the context uh, or you know meter and rhyme and rhetorical figures and all these these tools, but also right um, the experience of literature, right the experience of culture, um, the appreciation, um, the value, um, the some of the intrinsic things that I think uh, are absolutely have everything to do with uh, my experiences. It's not by accident that most people in my college still think that my book that just came out is about Don Quixote, uh, <laughs> because that's the association, you know, that my colleagues have of me. And, um, and I'll take that uh, association as a badge of, of, of honor, um, because, you know, the, the Quixote is, 
is always uh, near um, what I'm doing. Um, and, uh, and so it's, uh, you know, it, it all kind of folds into uh, who I am and, and what I do at Meredith College. And, and I think students, you know, they, I'm always clear to them, um, they don't need to go to Spain um, or Argentina or anywhere I've been. Um, but I, you know, really hope and encourage them to get, get somewhere. And um, my own worldview is absolutely informed by my experiences in the world. Um, and um, I think given how much I've received from those experiences, you know, I can only hope that my students would, would uh, have something similar. Um, and that I get to model that. And in Spain, I even better, I get to curate, you know. I like to just to think of myself um, these days when it comes to city abroad as is kind of a curator of experiences mm -hmm. and, and someone, someone who, um, is, uh, is about providing experiences or at least, uh, an opportunity for an experience and then letting students kind of have, um, their own, um, you know, we, we spend a day on the Camino, for example, it's not enough. I want to do the whole thing. I'm desperate to, to, to do the Camino de Santiago, but even a day has an impact and, and, um, all these these little experiences um, um, they 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 persist in, in in the lives of these students and that makes um, every effort that goes in the the less glorious side of it all the logistics and all the times you know um, booking train tickets on Renfe dot com doesn't work you know makes it all worth it because when it comes together uh, you know it uh, you forget any of um, the challenges or obstacles along the way. Well, I definitely see myself uh, recognized in, in your words, Jonathan. You're listening to the uh, voice of Jonathan Wade coming loud and clear over the phone from Raleigh, North Carolina. This is a new episode of The Written Page, and my name is Anton Garcia Fernandez. Uh, you'll be able to listen to this very soon on my YouTube channel, Anton GF. And uh, as Jonathan has mentioned just a couple of minutes ago, he has published a book uh, entitled Being Portuguese and Spanish, Reimagining Early Modern Iberian Literature from 1580 to 1640. And Purdue University Press just put it out a few weeks ago. And uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the book, Jonathan. Um, how did Great. the book project come about and why did you concentrate specifically on the 1580-1640 period? Well, I um, need to rewind the clock a little bit um, to a Portuguese class I took at my, uh, during my master's program. I did my undergraduate and master's at, at BYU um, in Utah and my, I was taking a Portuguese Baroque class. And one of the projects we had to do was uh, the professor assigned us in pairs to tackle different um, texts from our university's special collection in the library. Mm -hmm. And because um, one other student and myself had come to Portuguese from Spanish, he assigned us um, uh, a work written, uh, published in 1631 um, by Antonio G. Sosa G. Macedo. Um, titled Flores de España, Excelencias de Portugal, wherein um, this young author at the time, um, 25, basically kind of sets up the book as, hey, King uh, Philip, uh, you know, Portugal being one of the Spanish Empire's many uh, adornments or, or, or flowers, um, if I praise Portugal, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing glory to Spain, right? Because this is the period when uh, Portugal was part of, of the Spanish Empire mm -hmm. uh, following a crisis of succession. In 1580, um, Philip uh, II became Philip I of, of Portugal. Um, so anyway, back to this text, I was blown away. I, I was fascinated by what I saw going on in this text. Here you have this Portuguese enthusiast. I mean, there, there isn't, um, there isn't much there by way of anti Spanish or Castilian sentiment. Uh, it was really, uh, an affirmation of, of, of Portuguese greatness, uh, in, a, in very hyperbolic broke, uh, terms. And, uh, I was fascinated because he's doing this in Spanish. Um, he's clearly right. Carving out, an identity, uh, at least an identity that he uh, was was projecting on on the Portugal that he, that he knew and the Portuguese he had experienced, 
And um, I had conversations with this professor and he said, well, if you like, you know, like this guy, you need to know about this other guy. And uh, and then in the same semester or the following semester, I ended up in a golden age theater production class where we tackled uh, one of the many um, comedias written in Spanish by a Portuguese dramatist. In this case, it was El Muerto Disimulado um, by the uh, by Angela de Azevedo. And so just all these things began intersecting. And we're talking about, you know, this is 2000, 2005, 2006. Um, but I was so interested in, in beginning um, uh, that, that I ran with fish for my master's thesis. And then, you know, given my own youthfulness, I had a certain enthusiasm and had this certain idea about these authors that was naive a bit at the time, uh, as you would expect. Uh, I wanted them, I wanted to envision them all as these revolutionaries, you know, that they were um, subverting um, Spanish empire. And there, there is a, a place for that argument in some cases. Um, but, um, but I began understanding um, some of the nuances uh, as I moved into my, my, my uh, doctoral program and had the opportunity to continue this work to understand um, the, that it was much more complex. Um, uh, I quickly understood then, and, and it's still true now, although it's increasingly less the case, that um, for many years, um, well, during their lifetimes, these many of these authors were just like any other author uh, writing in Spanish. They were Portuguese, um, but uh, that wasn't really an issue in um, early modern Iberia. Um, it was, the, there was definitely an, an Iberian interculture that consisted of clearly of more than two cultures as well. I focus on the Spanish and Portuguese, but some of the, I think the framing that I, I do in this work is, is, has been done previously in other contexts. Certainly, um, Spain represents and the Iberian Peninsula represents, as, as you well know, uh, Anton, a plurality of identities, of languages, of cultures, and uh, and the writing. You know, the language of choice has has always been an interesting one, and depending on the historical moment, it was considered uh, right. Um, um, well, it was it was either considered as, as uh, the obvious choice, right? If you're going to write a comedia, of course you're going to write in Spanish because the comedia nueva, right, as as, as uh, described by Lope, uh, he didn't have to say it needed to be written in Spanish. That was just kind of understood. And so you, you see very little by way of, of the most popular theater of the time by Portuguese in Portuguese. Um, so... Uh, anyway, uh, there was just, it was endless. And in some ways it still is. Um, here I am 10 years removed from finishing my PhD and, uh, happy to see this work published. Uh, part of me knowing that it, or thinking that it should have been maybe finished earlier. I think everybody feels that way about work that they've, they've done. But another part of me knowing that, um, it's endless, um, uh, I mean, just even this past week, as I've, I've been working on an article, I thought, no, why didn't I, how did I, why didn't I work this particular thing into chapter four, right? Um, at a certain point, you just have to say that it's done. Um, it's time to get this work, this work out. But I remain, um, despite all these years, uh, fascinated with the choices the Portuguese were making Um how the and what the aftermath uh, within literary history you, know, you see by the 19th century a real turn uh, against uh, these authors you know as nationalism gains its foothold uh, uh, ideas about language loyalty uh, take hold and um, this generation uh, you know in many ways was lost and in, in other uh, cases disdained uh, not by by everyone, uh, but in some cases they just were they they disappeared and they were they weren't well known, uh, and so I saw as I began this journey a real opportunity um, to to shed light on I believe uh, and that's where the re reimagining part of the title of, of my book comes from is is uh, you really uh, do a disservice to uh, these these authors. Uh, and the text that they wrote, um, 
by right, a- imposing um, a- you know, anachronistically um, ideas about uh, language and culture that may have nothing to do with uh, with, with the, the way they conceived of uh, it at that time. Um, and uh, so it... Uh, it's it's ongoing. Uh, the Portuguese authors who wrote in Spanish. There's there's an openness uh, since really uh, in the 21st century. There's been a lot more work done. In some ways, it started with uh, women writers, um, um, as as more and more work were done on early modern Iberian uh, women writers, and it's it's expanded and uh, the field of Iberian studies, which is still much more developed. Um, in uh, you know since the nineteenth uh, since the nineteenth century, uh, those who focus on nineteenth, twentieth, and twenty first century uh, Iberian studies, uh, there's so much more done. But the field of Iberian studies is 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 growing quickly, um, and there's a lot more interest um, in understanding um, Iberia in those terms um, and framing, you know, not uh, you know stopping at borders. Uh, um, and, and that was, you know, something I guess I also saw always in my own particular work was I happened to be in a position knowing Span- enough Spanish and Portuguese to, to follow, um, these texts and these ideas wherever they led me. Um, and I think sometimes, uh, my Spanish and Portuguese, uh, is, is maybe impoverished a little by, by how much reading I do in, um, <laughs> within this specific, um, these specific texts, because uh, sometimes I think, no, am I saying that? Is that because it's, you know, of all my reading in early modern or all my reading of these Portuguese authors who sometimes, uh, um, you know, uh, yeah, introduce losisms into their writing and such. But I'll, I'll accept that uh, um, that mark on my own on my own work. Uh, again, uh, a kind of badge of of, of honor. Um, but that's really, you know, kind of how I found. Um, this work and how I got started. Now you uh, concentrate uh, on the years uh, immediately following the annexation of uh, Portugal and uh, right. the, the moment when Portugal becomes a part of uh, the monumental Spanish Empire at the time. Um, and you concentrate on uh, certain writers like uh, Manuel Faria Souza, like Angela de Acevedo, um, Jacinto Cordeiro. Well, all these uh, writers are writers who were Portuguese and who start writing in in Spanish around this time. I, I'm not sure if they were writing in Spanish before 1580 or not, but in any case, they are writing in Spanish around this time. There were writers before, like Gil Vicente, uh, back in the uh, Middle Ages. Uh, uh, and later that were already doing this. Certain wor- works were written in uh, Portuguese by them, some of them in Spanish, sometimes right. in, in a mixture of both. And I wonder, when you get to the late 16th century, early 17th century, these are writers who are contemporaries um, of uh, Cervantes, by the way. Um, right. What were the benefits that they stood to gain from writing in Spanish at this time, other than uh, wider readership? Yeah, so the the motives are it's it is an interesting question and one that for me is is has developed a lot since I first started reading these works because yes, um, almost uh, comprehensively you will see the argument you just alluded to um, the universality of Spanish Spanish being kind of the global language at the moment um, and so for an author wanting to to see their works reach a broader audience um, it was it was in Spanish. Um, now, um, that's not you know the, the the only reason, and even that particular reason has nuance within it because there were those who you know there was a way of, of talking about that that's simply you know a, a form of economics, right? Market forces and such, um, you know, sell more books, write in Spanish, but there were also those who are writing about Portugal and specifically are, are stating in, in the prologues to their works, I want the Portuguese glories to reach a, uh, a wider audience. So not just my work, but I want more people to know about um, about Portugal. I want to know people to know more about Camões. I want more people to know um, 
about the, this 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 place. Um, and so you have some economic uh, realities driving this. Um, you have some patriotic uh, um, forces as well um, at play. There's also literary preference that comes in, and you alluded to this. This isn't new in the 16th and 17th centuries. Mm-hmm. You have uh, Galician Portuguese, uh, which was uh, uh, during a time in the medieval period preferred in poetry. And uh, really, in the late 15th century, you you see uh, a sh- in, in Portugal um, uh, the beginnings of of, of authors writing, uh, electing to write in Spanish. Um, Gil Vicente, as you mentioned, um, and really, it's the interdynastic marriages between Portugal and mm-hmm. and uh, Castilla that uh, invites uh, this in, in, with, with really with greater intensity because Gil Vicente being a court uh, poet, um, he had oh, you know, consistently uh, Castilian royalty for whom uh, he was writing. And so you have this highly influential Portuguese dramatist uh, and not just influential uh, among the Portuguese, but throughout the Iberian Peninsula and, and beyond. Um, and he's, writing in Spanish, he's writing in Portuguese, he's writing in Spanish and Portuguese, and, and beyond, right? Uh, other other forms, Sayagues, um, these kind of pastoral forms that he works on. And so a real attention to language and the possibility of dramatizing language, using language as a character, uh, as, a, as a way of, uh, as a form of characterization. Now, it's not the case, even though you can you can take isolated examples and say, oh, here in this work, um, you know, the Span- the one speaking Spanish is the devil or the fool or you know, and so on and so forth. And mm-hmm. you can see in that uh, perhaps uh, uh, some playfulness on Gil Vicente's part, um, and and perhaps there is is some of that, but it's not consistent enough in his work to you know to then suddenly say, oh, he, he was, you know, uh, a Portuguese nationalist and he was, you know, fighting against Castile or something um, silly like that. Um, but there's fun to be had. and He uses language in, in this way. Um, and you'll see the this this choice uh, to write in Spanish that on some grounds, just because uh, it was in vogue, right? It was as popular um, and it didn't start uh, in 1580, but 1580 intensifies this practice. Um, beginning in 1580, you will have a very difficult time finding anyone, any Portuguese author um, of, of significance um, who did not write um, in, in Spanish. Uh, mm-hmm. And in most cases, uh, mostly in Spanish. Um, it is the case that, uh, and we know this from Fadi Souza's uh, autobiographical works, that he had t- texts written in, Sp- in Portuguese that he had, that he translated um, in order for them to be published. Uh, I, I have also um, um, explored some and argued in in, in, um, in one essay that you really see in the second half of the annexation period. Um, from 1610 to 1640, Portugal as a topic, um, you know, becomes uh, popularized. Um, uh, you find Spanish authors uh, still writing in Spanish, um, but writing about Portugal. And part of that is due to the fact that the Portuguese, uh, many of the Portuguese were saturating uh, the market with great text, uh, source material. If you're Lope de Vega and you're writing as often as Lope de Vega was writing Comedias, to have uh, new histories, new stories, new um, you know, um, uh, texts to draw from. Um, mm-hmm. And it, certainly it was going to have an impact. And, and so there was, uh, Portugal was in vogue and the Portuguese uh, were in vogue. Um, it did not change the choice of language because the market was still favored Spanish. The lack of court presence in Portugal had a lot to do with that because we know how much, how important in the early modern period, um, uh, a, a stable court presence was to the cultivation of the arts. And with uh, that loss in Portugal, as much as the Portuguese t- tried to convince um, 
Philip II of, of Portugal uh, to change um, his court from Madrid to Lisbon. Um, there was a, a whole kind of campaign, or at least an effort, to, 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 to do that in 1619 when the king visited um, Portugal. It, it didn't work. Um, Portugal, um, uh, in some ways, uh, the lack of, of works in Portuguese um, has a lot to do with the, the lack of, of a Portuguese court. Um, but it is interesting because it just like it didn't begin in 1580, it didn't end in 1640. Mm-hmm. Even though there's a Portuguese restoration war, even though Portugal, uh, Spain won't recognize until 1668 um, Portuguese sovereignty, um, even the king, right, uh, King uh, uh, João the Fourth, will will publish a defense of modern music, a defense of la música moderna, in 1650, and he chooses. Spanish, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of these things where you would think, you know, if if you if you're wearing if your your mind's tuned in the wrong way, you think, how could he do that? Here he is fighting for Portuguese. Uh, you know, here he is the 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 the, the king, right? Uh, and and there's this whole effort and a whole outpouring of texts dedicated to his legitimacy as king, and yet uh, nor he nor nor others defending Portuguese autonomy. Um, saw in the choice to write in Spanish um, anything uh, wrong. It doesn't mean there wasn't some anxiety. There were some voices after 1640 and before 1580. Probably the most famous uh, is um, Antonio Fajeda, who wrote Castro, as his most famous work, um, who, who only ever wrote in Portuguese, um, making him very unique in 16th century. Um, and also had very specific things to say about how uh, a Portuguese author um, should never um, you know, set aside um, the, the mother tongue uh, and, and uh, when, when he or she could you know, choose to write in Portuguese, why, right? why would an author not, right? Uh, so so the, these, these, this, it's not to say that this, um, this wasn't in, in the water, to, so to speak. And you, when you read some of the prologues to the works written by Portuguese and Spanish, you sometimes get a sense of the anxiety or the need to justify. Uh, almost, it almost reads at times as, as a form of apologetics. As widespread as it was, um, um, there's, there's some Portuguese who wanted to be identified as Portuguese. And there were some Portuguese who, who kind of never looked back, right? Once they started writing Spanish, once mm-hmm. they moved to, to Madrid. Um, and very successful authors, uh, but for others, they seem to never. They didn't want to um, to lose. Uh, they didn't ever want to give their audience reason to believe that um, that that their Portuguese identity, their Portuguese roots, weren't didn't matter to them. Um, and so we see this. Uh, and and I'm writing, actually working on um, an article right now about um, uh, a female a poet named uh, Mariana de Luna. And the only work of hers that we have record of is this simple, small collection of six poems written in praise of the newly appointed king. It's um, it's from 1646. And uh, two of the poems are in Portuguese and four in Spanish. And um, the, the, for these authors, the incongruency we might want to impose on that choice uh, just wasn't uh, wasn't the same for them, um, for the reasons I, I've mentioned, and and and, and still others. It's 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 a nuanced, uh, fascinating subject. It's one of the things I love to just kind of sit with, is all the the, the thoughts uh, that were guiding these choices to write in in Spanish um, about Portugal, right? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know it's it's clear to me, Jonathan, that uh, Spanish at the time was obviously the language of prestige, the way that French would become later, or the way that English right. may be today. Uh, but it also seems to me uh, like these uh, writers do not equate uh, national identity with language necessarily, right? And so. Um, I have always uh, seen language from the point of view of uh, a human-made technology for communication, or in this case for artistic creation. Um, I wonder, 
uh, if you agree with this or what your understanding of the concept or the idea of language is within the framework of this book. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you that um, I think part of the, the trouble that you, we, you can run into when reading identity in any context is, is to want to make identity as, uh, as a singular, right? When really identity is always a plurality. On the one hand, um, right, the Portuguese donned languages like they would a costume that fit the occasion, right? Mm -hmm. So here's an occasion that calls for Spanish. I'm, I'm using Spanish um, or Portuguese as a case may be, or any number of languages. So the Portuguese will make comments at times in their writing about the elegance, right? They had, they all had, there were these ideas about languages and, um, and some of them are, are actually comical um, and uh, may or may not be true with some of the attributions to Carlos V and right, this idea of the language you speak to your servants and the language you speak to God and your horse, right? Those kinds of things. <laughs> um, and when in reality, right, I, I see it, as you said, uh, more as a means uh, to an end. And, and so, yes, Portuguese born and there's value around this constructed identity that that many of these authors um, had. And in and, 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 and many ways, they coincide in, in this idea, idea of, of identity. But it wasn't the only identity they were well, it was operating within their culture, within their, within their, their own, um, paradigms, because they were as Iberian, right. As they were in some ways, Portuguese and the sense of self was a self that spoke Latin and spoke, you know, that was, that was a polyglot, right. It, it was, and so, um, this, this concept of self was, was plural. Um, and, you know, I happen to be natively from um, and, and we happen to be you know, have, holding this conversation, both of us in, in a country that um, has not known how to embrace uh, a, uh, pluralism in some cases. And, and particularly when it comes to language, even though it's it's very much a part of, um, you know, the early history of the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there is the joke uh, that, you know, um, well, not the joke. There's the reality of monolingualism here, and, and I've seen a, a bumper sticker, right? Right, that monolingualism can be cured. Um, <laughs> just as if you, you know, moving into a European context, um, even in the 21st century, right? There, there is more value. Not that there isn't linguistic nationalism and and so forth, but there is a value around um, um, polyglotism, right? Around uh, multilingualism, multiculturalism. Um, that I think is is not um, um, uh, something that um, we should disassociate from uh, 16th and 17th century. Truly, right? We're taught we're describing a moment in history in Europe um, where Europe, at least, is experiencing kind of, uh, or maybe the world. But let's just stick with uh, you know a, a Eurocentric view of this, which is that they're experiencing a, a global moment. Right. Mm -hmm. um, just like we are, would say you describe, you know, uh, uh, in the last you know, quarter century or so uh, in similar terms. Right. And uh, globalization and so forth. There there is a globalization that's happening then. And, and we cannot separate such um, large scale things uh, from from individual identity. Um, and uh, so uh, the linguistic nationalism. Uh, or the uh, that uh, that would follow, you know, um, was very different than the way that they were conceiving of language. But there still are interesting comments to be found in between the lines. And Cervantes himself had mm -hmm. very positive things to say about the beauty of of Portuguese. Um, and and so there was, you know, in some ways, a bit of a, you know, uh, there was a. I mean, this is the brook, right? Competition is 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 part of the game. And so in the, uh, the uh, competition of empire, um, surely, and, and, you know, uh, Nebrija says this in his, right, his grammar of mm -hmm. the Spanish language, right, that uh, he connects empire to language um, and understanding uh, the relationship uh, between those two. And, and so, again, it's, we, we, we would be, we would do an injustice to impose 
our 21st century views and of all these these concepts in their entirety on the period. But it would also be an injustice to say that they are devoid of the complexities and the nuance um, that their own time period um, um, held for 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 language. But I I am uh, with you that uh, uh, again there's um, there's an there's an author I uh, I quote in the book um, Leonard Forster uh, who has a book called The Poet's Tongues. And he really, he really goes, gets at this idea of, um, you know, the perform, performa, uh, the performative nature of language, mm-hmm. um, and the, how that was very much alive in the medieval and early modern period. I totally agree with with what you're talking about, uh, and in fact, you know, one of the greatest joys of uh, growing up in the northwest of Spain for my for for me was. Uh, from the get-go, being exposed to two languages, not just one. A lot of my students don't know at the university, and a lot of people in in the United States may not be aware that in the Iberian Peninsula there are other languages (laughs) spoken other than Spanish and Portuguese. And so from the get-go, I was exposed to both Spanish and uh, uh, Galician, Gallego. And then um, not only that, but, you know, uh, the city where I was born uh, lies a mere 45 minutes from the Portuguese border, maybe even less. And so for me, one of the most wonderful things was being able to travel to Portugal and in Portugal with my family, with friends, meeting people from there, and knowing that I was in a different country with a slightly different culture, with lots of things in common, but slightly different in the way they did things and the way they expressed themselves, um, and of course the language that they spoke, but which I could still understand. And and I think um, being exposed to that sort of gives you an idea of you know, there are other ways of seeing the world. There are other languages that are spoken. And then language kind of gives you uh, an, 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 an entrance, if not into a culture, at least gives you a chance to, to communicate with, with a lot more uh, people if you speak two, three, four languages than if you speak only one. That's, that, that's for sure. But, right. you know, to go back to what you're talking about uh, regarding the book, and the book, again, I want to say it, it's called Being Portuguese and Spanish, Reimagining Early Modern, Modern Iberian Literature, 1580 to 1640, uh, published by Purdue University Press, and uh, we're talking right now on the w- written page with my friend Jonathan Wade, who's the author of that book. Um, these Portuguese writers that you are um, reading here and interpreting here and, and uh, talking about in this book um, are Portuguese writers who write and publish in Spanish. Um, and even though they may not uh, use Portuguese for, for certain texts, it, maybe in some cases they even use more Spanish than Portuguese, I don't know, but still they are constructing a certain kind of uh, Portuguese identity. And I wonder uh, if you could give some examples uh, of, of, of in what ways do these traces of the Portuguese identity come to the fore in texts by, by some of these writers? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you for, for asking. In some ways, that, that is the, the drive, uh, driving force of, of the entire work, was trying to understand... Um, this discourse that they were constructing um, that surprisingly um, is, is it overlaps and coincides uh, time and time again. So, for example, um, certain, certain, uh, one thing that will come up and, and, and it, you would, you know, when you hear this, you knowing if you, if you, you know, Portuguese literature, it wouldn't surprise you that they all appeal to Camões. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we know, you know, all these years later, how important Camões is to uh, Portuguese um, literature, to Portuguese identity. Um, uh, in fact, in a week, right, it's the Dia uh, de Camões, uh, mm-hmm. one of the, the great national uh, holidays in Portugal. However, Camões' fate was by no means, you know, sealed and cemented, uh, his legacy uh, in some ways, it is, it is this generation of authors who did that work. Um, one author in particular, Manuel de Faria y Souza, spends 25 years uh, writing a 2,000-page commentary on, on Camões' um, greatest work, his epic poem, Luzia das. Mm-hmm. And uh, it is a monument of, 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 of literary criticism, uh, of a commentary, 
still uh, considered all these years later the most uh, influential piece of criticism on Kamoins. It, it has right there are things that are that are wrong with the things he got wrong, but he um, this particular author right saw as as a, felt a certain duty right to make sure that his poet, as he described it, right, Mi Poeta, um, was known throughout the world. Uh, as uh, that when the, when people thought of the epic, um, they would not rest on Homer and Virgil, but that uh, they would they would turn to Camões, um, and and he claimed uh, was was the greatest, uh, wrote the greatest epic of, of all in the Usuziadas. And in, in many ways, these two thousand pages are right uh, his thesis um uh exploring and 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 arguing that that very point and Camoins comes up over and over again and 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 again it's not because there was a tradition it's because they were inventing in in many ways they they, you know Camoins symbolically Mm -hmm. uh, almost almost poetically dies months before um the annexation right he dies in 1580 um and he became kind of this 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 uh, touch point, this reference point. Um, the work that's done related to his work, but also the symbolic meaning that he would have for these authors as they quoted him. Um, and and they do this. Um, you know, I think of of um, Antonio de Souza de Macedo, who I mentioned earlier, in his Flores de España. Um, you know, he he spends time with Camoins. Uh, they they all do in one way or another. Um, getting more kind of uh, into themes, uh, what you one of these things you'll see over and over again is this idea of Portuguese uh, electness, right? This idea that that Portugal, small you know, small Portugal, uh, how is this small nation uh, able to to accomplish such you know grandiose uh, things on on a global scale, right? How, and and what you know they were writing into their history, and the way they were reading their history was um, in terms of right uh, d- d- divine uh, intervention that God had elected and chosen Portugal, uh, and this wouldn't surprise anyone reading this time period. This is this is is not uh, uncommon. Um, but the, the conception it doesn't end at just you know uh, God made Portugal great, but there's something that I, I just uh, I, I describe as the David principle because Fadi Souza at one point will actually allude to the story of David and Goliath mm-hmm. and referring referring to Portugal as right this diminutive David right uh, versus this Goliath of a world. Um, maybe even Goliath being other, uh, uh, you know, the Spanish Empire, and yet um, with God's aid, right? This idea also in the Old Testament of even though, right, uh, Portugal is l- less in, in in numbers, it's fewer in, in numbers, right? It, it makes up for its quantitative deficiency with qualitative, right, excellence. Um, because again, there, this this writing of of history and historiography is important for these authors. Um, they're practicing all genres, right? I've, I've alluded to mm-hmm. theater some, but this is this is everywhere. This is in everything being written. You see this appeal to Camões. You see this uh, sense of Portuguese identity that's that's being constructed the very times it, it's it's being claimed. So you'll see, you, know, you, you get the sense that they are they are affirming a Portuguese identity at the same time that they're authoring, right, um, and 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 adding their voice to uh, previous voices and trying to c- create a coherent national discourse uh, around this, and and this idea of being kind of small, but their accomplishments being right. Um, yeah, you know, monumental. This, 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 this kind of use of antithesis um, shows up so often. Um, it, it also comes up in terms of language. Even though these texts are in Spanish, it is common um, for an author to bring in a Portuguese word, particularly one of cultural significance. And we see this in in uh, Comedias by An- Angela de Azevedo, for example, she'll use, she uses a, an adjective form of, of saudade, um, uh, the, uh, the, 
the, the female protagonist uh, speaking of right her longing for um, her her uh, male protagonist counterparts you know sp- talks about being right um, saldosa right saldosa um, mm-hmm. and and uses uh, this many times and and if that weren't enough there in this really meta theatrical moment um, that same character says to her her servant with whom she's speaking but in many ways it's a wink at the audience she says for those of you who don't know that term and and then goes on to kind of give it a a, a (laughs) quick explanation it's this beautiful moment right where um you know she's she's either can't find a word that she likes better than her native portuguese or is deliberately bringing portuguese into the text because why not? Uh, the play is situated in Portugal. Uh, there are all these other reference points to Portuguese um, place names. Why not bring in a word um, so rich, right, like uh, saudade it is in the Portuguese language and within Portuguese literature? And and so those type of types of um, uh, of moments where uh, uh, something. Even at the time, uh, it's not that we're reading the importance of Saudad onto that time period. Um, there are in, in treatises, right, Portuguese authors writing about um, Saudad and how it's an untranslatable word and, and unique to the Portuguese language kind of as a way of holding up Portuguese as a language. But again, um, doing so in Spanish without seeing in that, right, um, a, a problem of any kind. Mm-hmm. And so this this coherence doesn't come in, in a vacuum. They they did borrow and get some of these ideas from their the pioneers, Camões being very influential. Camões wrote in Spanish as well. Of course, his his great epic is in Portuguese, um, but Gil Vicente as well, and even Antonio Fajeda, who who never wrote in Spanish, still um, modeled in many ways for this generation. Um, that would find themselves born into, um, you know, this uh, this period of annexation, um, and eventually some of them writing after 1640, um, uh, in, in 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 arguing for Portugal's legitimacy and, and, and so forth. Not all of them will will will, will move uh, become so political in their writings, but some do. But uh, they saw, they got from their models, right, ideas of, uh, I mean, uh, about how uh, a writer, right, um, could use, right, their their talent, their interests um, to hold up Portugal. And in some cases, right, it's not Portugal. It's it's more local than that. Um, I've talked a lot about kind of the the Portugal, you know, versus Iberia, but there's it goes the other way as well. You know, some of these authors are as in enthused about um, their specific part of Portugal that they're from. And, and that would be something to be expected because, again, this isn't late 19th century nationalism. This isn't the kind of nationalism born out of mass education and mass media and mass transportation. Um, but it is uh, a brand of nationalism that has its its performative nature. And they certainly, right, um, we're working with a similar script, even though um, not all these authors, um, you know, we have evidence that they even knew each other. Um, these echoes uh, reverberate within mm-hmm. their texts, uh, these themes of, um, in some cases, there are some some jabs at, at, at Spain, um, right? There, there are conflicts between Castile and Portugal and the histories of the Iberian Peninsula and some of those um, uh, conflicts were um, were fl- not very flattering um, of, 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 of the Spanish. And so certain names like Aljubajota and battles that uh, are sometimes introduced into the text. But really, if you're looking discursively at uh, these texts, it's... Um, one of the, the the characteristics is just the amount of, of hyperbole, mm-hmm. um, particularly for someone like Fadi Souza. I mean, he was uh, modesty was not uh, a word you would <laughs> use to describe um, Fadi Souza, um, and uh, he he uh, was absolutely hyperbolic in his approach to everything he did. 
uh, even his own family. Right? He had uh, had ten kids, right? Um, <laughs> no, that's that's a silly a silly aside, but. Uh, he wrote tirelessly and he was never um, had the privilege of being um, a full-time writer. It was always something he had to find time to do at at night. Um, By his own account, he learned to write with both hands so that he could get his work done faster. (laughs) He could copy manuscripts and things, uh, work late into the night. Um, And again, um, you see what he's writing about and it is, uh, about uh, Portugal, a Portugal that in his lifetime, um, he has this great line in his autobiography where he says, Yo entré en Castilla, pero ella nunca entró o pudo entrar en mí. Hmm. Um, and again, maybe this is re- somewhat revisionist. This is him writing towards the end of his life. Mm-hmm. But but um, he he does seem troubled by the fact that he he left Portugal Believing uh, in his talents, believing in the the promise that uh, of of success that his talents he thought afforded him, and even though he became friends with with Lope de Vega and, and was widely published, he was always frustrated uh, as an author who aspired to more, um, and uh, that was really his motive again in his own autobiography for leaving Portugal in the first place. Um, at times there were attempts to return. Um, they never, um, oh, you know, um, uh, occurred and mm-hmm. he dies eventually, um, and was buried in his hometown in Northern Portugal, a place you've probably been pretty close to very small town, um, Anton, but I was able to visit once, um, um, the, the church where he and his wife are, are buried, um, but in life, he never returned. And, and because for some authors like him, um, it became complicated to be uh, in uh, Portuguese in Madrid. Um, there were a lot of suspicions about who were, you know, uh, loyalties and mm-hmm. who was uh, aligned with with one crown versus the other. Um, and, uh, I, you know, different different ideas about uh you know, uh, about all that didn't, didn't really help someone like Fadi Souza, who, you know, never uh, was in some ways was, was very flattering of, of, of the Hasberg dynasty and all of his writings. Um, but, um, and that was used against him by, you know, later generations to, to a certain extent. But, mm-hmm. but uh, anyway, with the, yeah, within uh, these works, um, you, you see uh, again, um, uh, you know, so many um, different markers of of what you know they're assigning to a Portuguese I- identity, um, and you know, some so one thing I don't get a lot into because it is one subject that has been um, visited a lot in in extant criticism, and that is the idea of of um, Portugal's kind of uh, being the fifth empire, the messian messianic destiny of Portugal, and Sebastianism, right, based on the Portuguese king um, um, Sebastião, who, who who dies in in, in Africa in, in a conflict in 1578, this idea that he was going to return, right? Um, that that does fit into to all this, but has been written about a lot. So uh, I don't uh, dwell too much on that. But um, this sense of Portugal having a destiny that's separate from the Spanish Empire. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there, there is a, uh, an underlying uh, message that you see in, in different texts at different times of, of Portugal um, um, imagining its community, um, to borrow, it, borrow from you know, that, that term from Benedict Anderson's work in, in the 90s about nations as imagined communities, but imagining that community as, 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 as being what it always was, which was uh, separate from um, what would become Spain. Um, Portugal's borders being fairly fixed from the 12th century on. Um, it, uh, it is in some ways maybe an accident that Portugal um, ended up uh, autonomous when other parts of Spain uh, didn't. Um, uh, the uprising in Catalonia in 1640 uh, was in some ways the moment that Portugal needed to, to make their move, um, and they did. Um, and, and we see how these questions of, of belonging 
um, who is Spain, who who isn't, and who who is a bit Iberian? The idea of an Iberian Union, you know, these these aren't concepts lost um, in the 21st century. Um, they they seem to to, to cycle, um, and and you would know this better than than I would, uh, Anton. You know, Jonathan, one thing that you do in the book that uh, I find interesting, you mentioned Angela de Acevedo before, and um, you do include in your study some female writers. And um, I wonder if 1580 to 1640, uh, late 16th century, early 17th century, what was the role of female writers in Portugal at the time? And do you see any differences between female writers and their male counterparts? Well, you know, this is this is early modern um, period, so you're you're writing as a woman, you're educated as a woman, right? Um, and that alone is 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 an exception um, to to the norm. But uh, we we have many examples, increasingly more uh, great work being done um, with many of these authors. Uh, in a lot of cases, right, they were able to pursue writing. And the cultivation of the literary arts uh, as nuns, uh, and the most uh, recognized Portuguese author of the 17th century being uh, Sor Violante de Seu. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, if you read her, what her contemporaries had to say uh, about her, um, uh, the, the, with, without objectifying her, they, they 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 were holding her up for her writing. Um, not as a, a female object, right? As 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 often the pedestaling happens, mm -hmm. and so I I I I I believe to to the credit of um, well I, I don't know if it's anyone's credit, but within that time period, I, uh, it seems as though the few women writers um, who, who of course had obstacles that their male counterparts didn't have, who of course, you know. Um, uh, had um, challenges uh, to seeing their works published that the men didn't. Um, um, when their works were known, they were celebrated. Um, and she was considered uh, the the tenth muse, and uh, uh, and as were some of her contemporaries in uh, in Portugal. I, uh, unfortunately, I mentioned Mariana de Luna earlier. Earlier, in some cases. We know so little about them, uh, their 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 biographies. Their, uh, but we know um, in 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 uh, Mariana de Luna's case, she's from uh, from Coimbra, um, and was educated. You know, uh, having been born into a family where that was possible. Um, ben, uh, Bernarda uh, uh, de la Cerda de Fejeda, another great um, Portuguese writer from the time. Yeah, they they will often uh, have poems and works uh, and lines dedicated to each other, um, and dedicated to some of their male counterparts who also dedicated works to them, and so there there seems to be a, a lettered community of sorts. Um, I, I we again are missing a lot of information about, um, you know how uh, what these relationships, if any, uh, in person, you know. Kind of relationships were mm -hmm. in in Violante Duceo's case, she she didn't enter the convent till she was, um, I believe, uh, on, near, on the age of thirty. So there was a, a life and a literary life before that moment, and the literary life continued. But uh, there was time in there uh, to be known and to know. Um, and you, if you look at who she's dedicating her works to, and some of the names I've mentioned. Um, and some of the praise she holds out for these authors is specifically for those who are writing uh, about Portugal and some of the ways that she, that she was and about um, King uh, Joan IV, uh, the way that she that she was. And for me, it was a priority to bring in all voices because what was driving this work was not so much a, a genre, a specific genre or one specific author. Um, but but really, this overall movement, this um, the coherence of discourse that you can see across genres, uh, ac across authors, and when you read these works, um, uh, I find no distinction um, when I'm reading uh, one of these texts that I've studied for this text or others that didn't make it into my book, but could have. 
uh, between the female authors and, and their male uh, counterparts in, in terms of the content of the the portuguese or the great Portuguese word Portugalidad, <laughs> uh, which I use a lot in, in, in the work, kind of a, a, a catch-all word that kind of gets us this idea of the essence of of what they were, what Portuguese, how Portuguese was signifying as a marker at, at the time. And really, you know, um, they're, uh, you, you know, you put these works side by side, specifically in what they're doing. Um, and uh, you're, you're not seeing, um, you know, a, a difference that you could assign to their you know, male or female identity. Of course, you know, there are certain things done in other works um, um, and uh, that, uh, that that maybe you, you, you know, someone would make that argument, but it doesn't enter into my own. The uh, passage from, I think, Azevedo that you were mentioning before regarding Saudade, uh, kind of reminded me in its presentation of Cervantes in a way, you know, um, in, 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 in the sa- sense of it bringing uh, attention unto itself, uh, attention unto the, the, the text itself, being right. a, a little bit at least uh, somewhat meta-literary in, in that sense. Uh, and we have mentioned before that these writers that you're studying in this book uh, were contemporaries of Cervantes. And I wonder mm-hmm. if you have found any sort of uh, intertextual dialogue uh, between any of their works and those of Cervantes, not just the Quixote, but you know maybe uh, other works like La Numancia or uh, La Galatea, El Persiles. Uh, have you seen any sort of uh, echoes in, in, in that direction or not? Um, within the, the particular scope of this book, you, you will find passages from authors like um, Sosa de Macedo and Faria Sosa, and, and they'll talk. Of course, in Faria Sosa's case, being a, a, a good friend of Lope de Vega's, maybe he was a little bit more <laughs> um, uncharacter- uncharacteristically hushed about his, his uh, admiration for Cervantes, but he does talk about the, the Quixote some, uh, but not only the Quixote in his autobiography when he lists some of his favorite authors of his youth um, and his, his early writing. Um, and Sosa de Macedo will mention Cervantes in, in the, the book I've mentioned. Um, but uh, Cervantes, so Cervantes you know, comes up uh, less so in their writings than in the studies about you know, these authors. Uh, there have been a lot of studies I realize of the last you know 50 years um, in which you know in, in an attempt to understand that this relationship, this interculture uh, and this cross-pollination between um, uh, Spanish and, and or Spain and Portugal, uh, is uh, Cervantes will often you know show show up there. Um, Cervantes himself, um, uh, evidence of his own travels in Portugal, um, and showing up in his writings, and so often it ends up being someone who's looking at Cervantes's writings and um, looking specifically at the Portugalidad within his writings. Um, but uh, within the, these uh, the writings of these seventeenth century authors, um, there 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 is there is some uh, work there, um, some references there. Um, I wish Fadi Souza had um, dedicated um, in a more of a sustained way. He does he does have some some positive things to say because he wrote so much literary criticism, even when he's not talking about Cervantes. Um, he's such an, and he had such an encyclopedic memory in mind, um, that he, uh, is one, um, who, uh, sh- it seems to be showing, you know, th- there's this idea of kind of Don Quixote as being initially read as a funny book and, and reason for that argument to exist, but you can see in Fari Souza, and this is one thing that some uh, critics have argued, some evidence of, of, of a more serious reading of the Quixote. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he does talk, in an, even if, if in an abbreviated form, um, you see him spend some time holding the Quixote and, 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 and kind of giving some weight to the Quixote that maybe um, 
criticism hasn't uh, always acknowledged of, of the way it was read um, within its its context. Uh, so there's there's some interesting um, crossroads there, and and there's been some really important work done um, about the relationship between Quixote and Portugal, and and Cervantes more generally in, in Portugal. Um, I'm I'm I uh, defer to to uh, the the experts um, out there who've who've written on on the subject. There is an addition of, for example, the Quixote in Portuguese that mm-hmm. I'm anxious to get because the introdu- introduction, um, um, and I'm forgetting right now um, who this was by. Uh, oh, it's Maria Fernanda de Abreu, who uh, did an addition of the Quixote, and she's done some marvelous work on on the intersection between the Quixote um Translate uh, one topic that has been visited a lot is is the curious lack of translations of the Quixote in Portuguese for really the first two hundred years of the Quixote. There's very little there, and so some works you know that's been dedicated to why that is, um, and, uh, and and so it uh, there is a uh, there is work that's been done and, and I think work to be done some some work. Some work based and inspired um, by the, the Quixote. Um, there's a play that comes out in, I think, the second, te- the second half, I want to say the 1650s, uh, about the Quixote um, that I have not read yet. But uh, yeah, that's, that's just one, one part of it. I, I've, I've tried to monitor at times um, my interests, you know, and, and it just really doesn't um, Wayne, sometimes I get tired of reading my own ideas, um, <laughs> as, as happens. Uh, but the ideas, uh, I should say reading my own words, uh, but the ideas driving them, um, are, are still, uh, you know, really life giving for me and, and, and fire up my, my imagination and make me want to, to, to learn more. Uh, not something I'm always able to do. You know, I'm at, uh, a small uh, college that I love um, that's that prizes uh, teaching above all else. Mm-hmm. And, and as, as, uh, as I, I do as well, but, you know, as you, as you know, I, I think as well, Anton, um, sometimes um, in such a context, it, it is hard to find time um, for uh, research and, and writing. Um, I know that uh, during this pandemic, although I don't really consider this a hardship considering um, the degree of hardship across the globe, um, you know, work is, is different. Uh, when you're working from home with young, young children, the thoughtful kind of work is harder to do. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's, there's always the family and, uh, and the kids and, you know, other hobbies that you have. And so, you know, it is, it is, it is difficult sometimes to, to, to find the time. I always, uh, admire writers like, uh, Anthony Trollope, for example, who was able to get up real early in the morning and work for two or three hours, even before he went to work. But, uh, I don't know that we are all able to maintain <laughs> that kind of, uh, activity. This is a new episode of The Written, written Page, uh, and we're chatting today with uh, Jonathan Wade, who just published a book called Being Portuguese and Spanish, Reimagining Early Modern Iberian Literature Between 1580 and 1640. Uh, my name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, coming to you from Jackson, Tennessee, here in the United States of America. And uh, as we're winding down the conversation, that Jonathan, because I've had you on the phone for almost an hour and a half now, and um, it's it's really <laughs> <Time well spent. laughs> it has been a, 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 a true pleasure. But I still have a couple of really quick questions that I would like to ask you um, regarding the book. You know, it, it seems like every um, academic book that has come out in the last several um, decades, you know, has to have a sub it has to have a subtitle, and I am <laughs> as I am as uh, guilty as the as, as the next. Uh, guy about that, you know, for articles and stuff like that. But, you know, in your case, I think the subtitle is very interesting. It's uh, Reimagining Early Modern Iberian Literature. And I'm wondering if you could uh, briefly speak about that subtitle and uh, what do you consider to be new about your approach to this topic? Well, um, I I, uh, certainly identify with what you're describing about uh, subtitles. even when I search my memory for, you know, anything I've, I've, I've presented at a conference or, or published, I think even when I've avoided a subtitle, I've, 
I haven't avoided, you know, doing something tricky like saying, giving a title and then saying or, and then another possible <laughs> title or something uh, that we academics uh, love to do. But uh, thanks for your question. So a few things that are going on for me with um, this title, the, the reimagination um, is, is a couple of, at least a couple of things. On the one hand, as I describe in, in, um, in the, the my, my, my first chapter uh, where I try and work through some of the concepts and, and the frameworks that I'm, I'm using, um, I definitely engage the topic of, of nations. Um, and one of the uh, authors uh, that I bring into that conversation is Benedict Anderson and, mm-hmm. and his work in describing a nation as an imagined community. And even though the nations that uh, I'm describing and, and then the, the nationalism or, or nationalist discourse that I'm describing is very different, um, the utility of, of, of his framework is still uh, very much real in, in my work. Yeah, so this idea of you know a community, uh, a smaller community, right? The, a kind of community that was possible in early modern Portugal, that um, truly are imagining, right? Um, a, a, a Portugal in their works, they're projecting on the past. Uh, that that projection has implications in the present, and eventually, right? Uh, in in the, the the future that follows those works. Uh, we see Portugal um, uh, a sovereign nation uh, again, and so the, part of it is building on this idea, right, of of these authors being uh, belonging to something um, that they themselves described as 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 a nation, uh, and and use plenty of other terms. So the what I'm in part is uh, doing is reimagining the the place of these authors, reimagining what they were doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, because this particular approach um, hasn't, uh, especially in English, um, been um, discussed in any sustained way. So reimagining their their actual works and what they were doing and, and how these authors belong into a single conversation. But in a broader sense, um, reimagining you know their place in literary history, as I alluded to earlier. Um, despite their own um, popularity, uh, the, the, the ubiquity, uh, um, ubiquitous nature of, of their writings, their names in some cases, and others not, um, uh, within their own lifetimes and in, in the aftermath and the decades that followed, um, you know, history had a way of kind of um, marginalizing them uh, so in some ways just naturally. Uh, and then later with more of an agenda as, uh, as we see in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And so I want, I'm reimagining in this book, uh, a space, um, within a canon that, uh, that is bigger than the Portuguese canon. Although if you want to call it, you know, if you want it there to, uh, to talk about a Portuguese canon, uh, there's, there's a place that there's a way they should be reimagined there. If you want to talk about a Spanish canon, um, there's there's a way um, that they should be reimagined in that space, but more importantly, to conceive of that time period um, and hold the all spaces, not just right, because this isn't uh, uh, a duality, right? Uh, there there's more than two, even though I focus on two, but to hold Iberia as a whole and say, well, well what would we have if we are reimagined? Um, the culture of this time, this this interculture, which is is a term that's been along, around for a long time, and, and there have been various moments in history where um, uh, critics and historians have have given names to kind of this this phenomenon, um, but reimagining a, a canonical space that doesn't stop um, at a boundary, a political boundary, a linguistic boundary, but to hold Iberian culture as a whole. And see, you know, how productive that can be for our our understanding, uh, because it, within that space, not only do you uh, can you appreciate, I think, um, how texts and, and authors um, intersect with with both in the case of, of Spanish and Portuguese, mm-hmm. um, but also uh, 
you you know you come away from you know um, this reimagining um, with uh, a sense of, of 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 what Spanish is without you know uh, you, in other words you you have an idea of what Iberian is uh, a better idea of what Iberian could have meant in that context um, or could mean as a category. Um, but you also come away with a different understanding of, of what the Portuguese canon is and the Spanish canon. So this reimagination just is, it, it works on so many levels. Um, and, and, and it's also fair. It's, it's also more, um, uh, you know, realistic. I mean, this was <laughs> the culture that I'm trying to, to get at and understand is I believe closer than, um, a work that would, would imagine right uh, that that you know that the, the Portuguese can only be conceived within you know uh, a Portuguese framework. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, it's not to say there isn't a place uh, uh, for that and, and reasons to draw different lines than I've drawn. But I um, seeing that this that the, this this work hadn't really been done in this particular way, um, and also just because. I think the way I'm I'm wired as as a reader, as a critic, um, as as a scholar, I've always kind of conceived of of the work that I'm trying to do in terms of crossings. Um, Iberia being itself, um, you know, this this crossroads and encrucijada. Right? I think mm-hmm. of all the different words that that come from from um, that that the, the the word cross in English or or in Spanish and Portuguese. And and I see you know kind of crossings as being you know um, one of one of the, the words that describes what I what I do, and that um, that the, that period invites that that kind of a framework I believe um, because that's what they did that's what they were doing and uh, as 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 writers that's what they're doing as as you know in the cultivation of literature and art art that's what they were doing as as politically that's what was happening right we see these kind of crossings and intersections um we see this culturally we see this linguistically um and uh and so you know i i intentionally wanted iberian in the title i wanted and i know being portuguese and spanish um alone you know i knew wasn't exactly gonna work uh, because uh well i mean it, it has its meaning but for a lot of people they would see that and think what what does that mean um like my brother-in-law said to me when he saw the title he said can you explain and i said buy the book and then i told him what it meant <laughs> um but uh this idea of getting spanish in the title and portuguese in the title and Iberian in the title um, was was important to me, and I'm particularly grateful for a very small detail that anyone would notice, but it, it's very meaningful to me. Which was, I, I had this idea of something that might happen, but never had voiced it. And then the editor for the um, um, Purdue Studies and Romance Literatures um, uh, came forward with the same idea, which was. You know, all of the the, the series, uh, the PSRL series, um, they have vertical bands um, that identify kind of generally the subject area, and it, it basically, you know, you end up with red uh, for Italian, blue for French, yellow uh, for Spanish, and green for Portuguese, and. Um, she suggested, well, let's do one in green and one in yellow. And I thought, exactly, right? Um, and somebody understands what I'm trying to do. Again, it's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a small, such a small detail, but I thought it encapsulated perfectly what I'm attempting to do, which was if we pull these two together um, as best as, as I am able. And, and I'm you know, always very aware that there are people – who are better at doing this than I am, but nevertheless, right? Pulling this together, you know, what would happen? Right? What can, what can we understand that maybe we um, we you know didn't understand, or what? You know, how how in doing this do we understand early modern uh, Iberia better? Um, and uh, so that's you know that's that's kind of that the subtitle um, means to me, and uh, and the, some of the ways that it it signifies. Um, and um, and crosses with what I'm doing in the work.
The series that Jonathan alludes to is the Purdue Studies in Romance Literature series, uh, and that's within that series, uh, his book has been published, uh, and it's called Being Portuguese and Spanish, Reimagining Early Modern Iberian Literature from 1580 to 1640. And my final question, Jonathan, it might be a little bit humorous, but uh, this is a book that you wrote. It's a book that you wrote in English, and I'm wondering if... Uh, you you had any doubts as to whether it should be in English, Portuguese, or Spanish? In the context of a book like this, that that that, that kind of doubt would be would be very much apropos, don't you think? <laughs> yes, um, and you know, honestly, I, I I I guess I always assumed I would write it in Spanish. Uh, sorry, write it in English um, as as my native language, um, but that I would be, you know, there would be so much Spanish and Portuguese going on um, within the text that, you know, kind of that, that mix uh, would, would have, you know, uh, you know, it, it would, it would, it would all show up. I didn't I feel like, uh, you know, um, much was lost. Um, although it would be interesting, you know, I, I, I don't anticipate that this uh, happening, But, you know, if ultimately, you know, I had a version in Spanish and a version in Portuguese um, to go with this version in English, you know, it would be it would be it would be fabulous. Um, I know my my uh, Portuguese uh, would need uh, a, a, a strong assist. Uh, my Spanish may be less of an assist, but still probably an assist in there. Um, it is the case that the Portuguese that I used needed to be translated. So I don't think that writing in Portuguese um was um uh, an option um uh, for this particular um publisher um but yeah it's 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 in english i hope that um yeah that that doesn't mean that uh it it won't um catch um yeah, on in in spain and portugal where the most important work is, is being done uh in some ways i i feel like i I miss out by not being able to be a part of those intellectual communities. I, I did manage a, a conference um, in January at the Universidad de Sevilla um, dedicated specifically to poetry, but in this kind of context of uh, uh, versos ibericos was mm -hmm. the theme. And it was just, it was a lovely experience. Uh, but I, I realized in being there, like that this is kind of, you know, uh, um, Yeah, more or less uh, another one of these gatherings, kind of like what, what to me was like, oh, this is this is so great. Finally, I'm with my people, you know, kind of kind of thing. Uh, although I love the organizations I'm a part of, you know, I'm I'm kind of an outlier with with what I do. Um, and to be at this conference and to interact with with some people doing some really great work um, was was a joy. Um, and so, you know, even though it's in English, I, I do know, especially from being there in January, I do know that my, even not even my dissertation, which is uh, from Vanderbilt, written on the topic, um, which has been, you know, uh, easy to find via Google for, for many years, um, and, and really anticipates that what I'm doing in this book um, uh, has has been read. Um, I, I I meet people um, um, in yeah, from Spain and Portugal and people who in doing this work who who have, have cited that uh, that that work. So I feel like it, if there were ever a time uh, where I work in English about um, early modern Iberia, I had a chance um, to uh, be of interest uh, to. Um, Um, our friends and colleagues in, in Spain and Portugal, uh, it's probably now. <laughs> so hopefully that's the case. <laughs> For anybody out there who may be interested in the book, Jonathan, uh, after listening to our conversation, uh, where can we find the book? And also, uh, what projects, of any, are you working on right now? So the book is available on Amazon. Um, it's also available directly from the publisher, Um And it's probably worth saying that if you go through Purdue University Press, um, I will just say, because why not, that if you go through uh, uh, University Press and you use uh, the discount code that I just quickly pulling up, um, 
It is Purdue 30. Uh, it gets you 30% off for what it's worth. Um, so that's how you can get uh, the book. It's available um, also as uh, an EPUB, uh, EPDF, and, and so forth. Um, so currently, I am actually um, the author I mentioned uh, a couple times in the course of our conversation, Marianne de Luna. Um, I am... Um, I know a couple of scholars, um, Valerie Hegstrom and Banda Anastasio, uh, who are guest editing the Revista de Escritoras Ibéricas. Um, they're mm -hmm. specifically dedicated this particular issue to um, early modern um, kind of exchange um, and, and communities, intellectual communities between Spain and Portugal. So I, I was really interested um, and uh, that's where uh, so I'm, I'm working on an article on Mariana de Luna, who wrote a, um, a little work called Hamayet um, de Flores, um, you know, Bouquet of Flowers. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes I don't know if I should just fully embrace my Brazilian Portuguese and say Hamayachi, which is natural, or, or feign some version of, of continental Portuguese that I um, yeah, I'm kind of a hack at, so, uh, <laughs> my apologies for sometimes being in between, <laughs> but I'm, I'm working on that article. It, it, it basically takes her text, um, about, uh, which, you know, in the title is, uh, says Flores. And, and I look at that other text by Sosa de Macedo, um, also, um, where he titles his work Flores España and kind of understanding how these flowers, right, are functioning, within uh, the respective works and particularly kind of arguing that um, for the, the, the differences that there are in, in the works and their purpose and scale, um, they seem to both uh, be right delivering flowers uh, uh, of a cel celebratory nature, right? Uh, um, the occasion uh, for the flowers, right, is Portugal. Um, in Mariana de Luna's case, because Portugal is uh, uh, now, yeah, you know, um, has a new, uh, a Portuguese king again. And in Solzhi Macedo's case, well, he's just thinks Portugal's pretty great and, uh, <laughs> and does not tire of talking about how great Portuguese rocks are and Portuguese grass and Portuguese towns and everything else you can imagine. Uh, so that's one, one article, um, that uh, I'm working on. I'm actually, uh, to, to your earlier question about women writers, um, am also, um, been interested in prologues, um, and, uh, Bernarda Fajeda de la Cerda, um, in her epic, uh, poem, España Libertada, um, has some interesting things to say, uh, but prologues, uh, themselves, they've been studied in, um, in, in Spanish, um, but I'm particularly interested in kind of um, the confessional nature of some prologues in the early modern period, uh, particularly with these questions we've talked about today of of um, writing in Spanish and what they're writing about. And, and even Fadi Souza describes uh, in one of his prologues the fact that that prologues are a kind of, of confession, uh, which I, I find fascinating. So I look uh, in another work that I'm trying to develop, uh, look at that, that, that topic. So, so no end to the fun, um, and, uh, fortunate to, to, to do what I do and, um, and fortunate to have shared, um, a number of those years uh, with you, Anton. I, I appreciate uh, the chance to, to come on uh, to, um, to your, your show and uh, have a conversation. Well, thank you, Jonathan. I wish you the best of luck with all that uh, work that you're engaged in, which is extremely interesting to somebody who cares both about Spanish and Portuguese literature like myself. And um, I do appreciate your giving freely of your time to sit down and uh, chat about your book and about your research with us here on the written page. And of course, you can come back anytime, take the best of care of yourself and your family. And of course, uh, greetings to you and your wife and your uh, beautiful daughters. Thank you, Anton. You too. And I hope that uh, one of these days uh, we the conversation is face to face and in Galicia. Well, that would be absolutely fantastic, and we will. Uh, I will look forward to that time for sure, Jonathan. Excellent. This has been a new episode of the Written Page. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, and our.
Uh, guest today was Jonathan Wade, an associate professor of Spanish at Meredith College in North Carolina, a good friend of mine who has just published his book, Being Portuguese and Spanish Reimagining Early Modern Iberian Literature Between 1580 and 1640. Check it out. It's out on Purdue University Press, and it came out just a few weeks ago. Again, my name is Anton Garcia Fernandez. Mine is the copyright of this uh, uh, conversation of this podcast, The Written Page, which was recorded without any sort of cuts live here in Jackson in the state of Tennessee in the United States of America in the month of June of 2020. Very soon you'll be able to listen to it on my YouTube channel, Anton GF. For now, até logo, até breve. So long, everybody. <laughs>